And hello once again, everybody. Thomas here. Thank you for joining me. This is the first episode of SFF 180 for 2015. Uh, I was planning to do this particular video kind of on New Year's Day itself, but I was feeling a little bit under the weather at the time, you know, just my throat, again, scratchiness, kind of avoiding a cold, but I'm feeling much better now, climbing out of it, so that's all a good thing. And so let's talk about 2015. Let's talk about the new year. What do we have to look forward to this year in SFF? Well, it turns out quite a lot. This is potentially a very exciting year coming on the heels of what was a very exciting year. 2014 was a uh, tremendous year for the genre in so many ways. And this year, the trend looks like it's going to continue. But for my own part, uh, what you're not going to get from me in this video is anything in the way of a specific New Year's resolution, particularly anything pertaining to a specific target, a definite stated number of books that I intend to read this year. I'm not gonna do that. I tried doing that last year, and you know what? I failed to meet my goal so spectacularly that if I were gonna do that again this year, it would be like stacking failure on top of failure, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it's not the sort of thing that's helped very well when I read uh, tweets like this from my friend Sarah. <laughs> yeah, um, great. Thanks a lot there, Sarah. Good job making my whole life feel like it's a lie. Uh, but you know what? I'm not daunted. All I'm going to do this year, the only goal I'm going to set this year, and the only promise I'm going to make is to read as prolifically as I can, as many books as I can, and enjoy myself as much as my overall schedule, both professional commitments and personal commitments, as much as that allows, I'm just going to read as much as I can and enjoy myself. Now, what exactly am I looking forward to reading in 2015? Well, everything kind of seems like a broad brush <laughs> term. So uh, let me get the sequels out of the way first, right? 2015 is going to be a big year for sequels and continuing series novels. So you got your Brian McClellan and you got your Steven Erickson and your Luke Skull, and your John Scalzi, and your Scott Lynch, and you got your Joe Abercrombie, and your James S.A. Corey, and your Daniel Abraham, and blah, 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 all those guys. And you know what? Um, yeah, that's great. I I'm definitely looking forward to all that stuff. I'm looking forward to pacing my reading schedule in those cases where I have, you know, series where I I've got earlier novels in the series to catch up with. Um, so everybody who's been bugging me about uh, reading The Expanse and all that, yeah, gonna get that done. So, not to worry. I I'm very much looking forward to those, just like everybody else is. But you know what? You know, for me to be the 500th guy on BookTube uh, doing a video going, uh, wow, I can't wait to read the next Mistborn novel, or the next Gentleman Bastards novel, or, um, golly gee, I wonder if The Winds of Winter is going to finally come out this year. You know, it's, that's just kind of pointless. It's like, uh, yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. What else are you looking forward to doing in 2015? Maybe, uh, breathing oxygen, you know, eating food. So yeah, you know, there's not that much point in talking about the stuff that we all already know about and that's, all, uh, that's that obvious. I would much rather discuss the things that really, really have my interest piqued. Uh, some fresh ideas, some familiar faces, uh, some new blood. Uh, there's no way, of course, that I can possibly cover everything coming out in the year, but there's some really cool stuff that I'm looking forward to and I think you should be too. So, without further ado, here are 15 novels to get excited about in 2015. On May 19th, Neil Stevenson releases Seven Eves, an apocalyptic far-future thriller about what happens when a cataclysmic event wipes out all human life on Earth with the exception of seven survivors, all of them women, hold up aboard the International Space Station, with a bunch of frozen embryos. Now, fast forward 30,000 years, and billions of the descendants of these women are uh, living aboard a ring of affluent orbital habitats. And as plans are being made to explore the Earth's surface once again, uh, it's discovered that there are, in fact, primitive humans left alive down there after all. The Trader Baru Cormorant, coming from debut novelist Seth Dickinson from Tor, on September 15th, is a book that I first heard about a couple of months ago, uh, back when Cameron Hurley, who was uh, sent, you know, galleys for the purposes of providing a blurb, went absolutely out of her mind with joy on Twitter over how awesome the book was. It's described as an epic fantasy geopolitical tragedy 
Uh, it's sort of pitched as Game of Thrones meets Guns, Germs, and Steel. Anyway, it's, uh, let's have a look here. It's protagonist Baru uh, is uh, vowing to avenge herself against the Empire of Masks, who have conquered her homeland. Uh, and she's going to do this by working her way up uh, within the Empire and devising a dangerous power play that could end up saving her people, but at potentially too high a personal price to pay, transforming her into the very kind of tyrant that she is fighting against. Kim Stanley Robinson returns with Aurora on July 7th, and it appears to be a story about a generation ship, which is a really great old-school SF idea that could do uh, with a fresh telling. Now, of course, this comes as a news that Robinson's award-winning Mars trilogy is being developed for television, and of course, um, his Nebula win for 2312 uh, is still very fresh in everybody's minds. So 2015 could be a really, really big year for Kim Stanley Robinson. Now, among the most exciting news for the new year is the debut of a brand new SFF imprint uh, from Simon & Schuster, Saga Press. And if its launch titles are anything to go by, um, looks like everybody's TBR piles have just gotten a little bit bigger. Uh, on April 7th, Saga releases the long-awaited debut of the multi-award winning author Ken Liu, The Grace of Kings. This is a sweeping epic fantasy about two friends who have uh, led a rebellion against a tyrannical emperor, and now that the man is deposed, they are now becoming very bitter political rivals. Also from Saga, Stina Light's Cold Iron arrives June 23rd. Now, it's a flintlock fantasy, let's have a look, uh, in which the black sheep son of the royal family of Elidor must prove himself to be the military leader his nation needs to defend against invading barbarian hordes. Now, Stina is a two-time uh, John W. Campbell Best New Writer nominee, uh, also a personal friend, and uh, this book has her stepping away from the dark contemporary fantasy of her uh, Fae and the Fallen series into, I guess, towards more of a dark epic fantasy uh, idiom, I suppose. But uh, her writing is always top-notch, and uh, so this book is going to be very, very highly anticipated uh, by those readers who put her on the Campbell shortlist two years running. And now that I've stepped into the ring of books written by friends of mine, I suppose I should announce The Thorn of Denton Hill. This is the debut novel by Marshall Ryan Maresca, and it comes from Daw on February 3rd. Uh, the protagonist is a magic student on uh, a personal vendetta against the crime lord who murdered his father. And when he steals uh, a shipment of magic artifacts uh, that were intended for some of this crime lord's clients, pretty much everybody in town comes after him. Now, uh, the story sounds brisk and exciting. I, I have no idea. Part of me is hoping that it is uh, like the epic fantasy equivalent of a Guy Ritchie movie. Um, but in any event, uh, Daw is putting Marshall on the fast track because this book's sequel, A Murder of Mages, comes out July 7th. Now let's go back to Saga Press for just a moment because word has come in that uh, they are planning, uh, at long last, the U.S. release of Nettie Okorfor's Lagoon. You'll remember this one? I reviewed it last summer. It's this wild alien invasion novel uh, set in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, so that's great news. Um, that's coming out July 14th, but that's not all. Uh, Nettie Okorfor fans have a bonanza this year because uh, The Book of Phoenix, which is the prequel to her world fantasy award-winning Who Fears Death, comes out from Daw on May the 5th. So let's have a look here. Uh, it says it's the story of Phoenix, grown and raised in New York's Tower 7, among other human genetic experiments. She's an accelerated woman with unusual abilities, only two years old, but with the body and mind of an adult woman. Phoenix has never been outside and has spent her short life reading ebooks, running on her treadmill, and basking in the love of Saeed, mm, another ward of Tower 7. But one day, Saeed sees something he was never meant to see and takes his own life. Devastated by his death and Tower 7's refusal to answer her questions, uh, Phoenix finally begins to yearn for her freedom, but obtaining that freedom comes with a heavy, highly destructive price that not only changes Phoenix forever, but seals the fate of her world. Now, it's interesting because as a prequel to Who Fears Death, this sounds like an entirely different setting and an entirely different um, uh, plot and set of themes for the book, but suffice it to say, Nettie does not do anything by halves, and the story promises to be every bit as tense and compelling as Who Fears Death. N.K. Jemison is also back in 2015 with the fifth season. This is the first novel in a new series, The Broken Earth. It comes out from Orbit on August the 4th. It's an apocalyptic fantasy saga set on a world spanned by a single continent, undergoing a magical cataclysm, and the story 
focuses on one woman's quest to rescue her daughter. Naomi Novik, best known for her beloved, if uh, a bit long in the tooth, Temeraire series, uh, returns on May 19th with Uprooted. This is a fantasy apparently inspired by Grimm's fairy tales. Now, some advanced buzz uh, from fellow writers like Lev Grossman and Cassandra Clare uh, seem to indicate that this could be a much darker affair for Novik than we're used to seeing, but uh, hopefully no less exciting. And comeback of the year could very well go to the legendary Michael Moorcock, who releases The Whispering Swarm on January 13th from Tor. Now, it's his first novel in nine years. It's the start of a trilogy. Let's see, it says it will follow a young man named Michael as he simultaneously discovers himself and a secret realm hidden deep in the heart of London. Well, now, the 75-year-old Moorcock, who has spent the last several years living in my home state of Texas, uh, is one of epic fantasy's most influential living figures, and so this makes the book a highly anticipated event indeed. Kate Elliott revisits the world of her Crossroads trilogy when the Black Wolves arrives on October 6th. Now, it's about a disgraced warrior who must face the possibility, or the necessity, actually, of returning to the service of the king whom he betrayed uh, when open war threatens the entire nation. Also from Orbit, Ian Tregillis, a writer who has a very high critical pedigree, uh, returns on March 10th with The Mechanical. It's a steampunk tale about a robot soldier who escapes his servitude, or its servitude, uh, in a bid for freedom and equality. Now, Ian is a guy who comes at pretty much anything he does from a very weird and fresh angle. Uh, you can watch my review of his previous book, uh, Something More Than Night, which is like the divine comedy of Dante sort of filtered through Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. And well, you can watch that review right here on the channel, and I'll put the link down. Victor Milan, a writer who is not terribly well known outside of his uh, 1986 cyberpunk novel, Cybernetic Samurai, and his association with such a series as Wild Cards and Rogue Angel. Uh, he bursts into epic fantasy in a big way on July 28th with The Dinosaur Lords, which uh, is a book good old George R. R. Martin himself has described as uh, you know, Game of Thrones meets Jurassic Park. Now, that alone has sold me the book, but uh, I admit to finding uh, Milan's previous work hit or miss at the best of times. So, hopefully, this is one that lives up to expectations. Now, Wesley Chu kicks it up a notch on July 7th with Time Salvager from Tor. Uh, in a future when the Earth is a toxic, abandoned world and humanity has spread to the outer solar system to survive, the tightly controlled use of time travel holds the key to maintaining a fragile existence among the other planets and their moons. Now, uh, let's have a look here. It says James Griffin Mars. Our protagonist is a Kron man, a convicted criminal, recruited for his unique psychological makeup to undertake the most dangerous job there is, missions into Earth's past to recover resources and treasure without altering the timeline. Now, that sounds really exciting. And finally... The Galaxy Game by Karen Lord is the story about three young people in a school for the psionically gifted who find their lives at a crossroads when uh, seething tensions between rival star-faring factions come to a head. Uh, Karen Lord uh, is a writer who has had a great critical acclaim. Uh, this uh, book promises character-driven action storytelling, and the book sounds like it could appeal to fans of uh, Ender's Game or Ready Player One. So anyway, this one comes out January 6th from Delray Books. And there you have it, my dear readers. 15 exciting, highly anticipated books for the year 2015. And it's all part of the broad canvas of science fiction and fantasy that I think is going to make this year full of great and exciting adventures for all of us to enjoy. Um, what are you guys looking forward to most in 2015? Let me know in the comments. Uh, but if you enjoyed watching, as always, please leave a like, share this video far and wide with your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. That is how SFF 180 grows as a channel. Thank you again, and until I see all of you next time, happy reading.